All right. Welcome back, Reginaldo. Are you there? Yes. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. How are you? All right. Looking good in summary. There he is with his chickens. <laughs> All right. Well, um, for those who've been attending thus far, you don't need any introduction. Um, we have, you know, laid out a, a, a series of presentations where you're going to start with the, the, the deeper framing of, you know, colonization and indigenousness and work us through our own process and then towards cultural um, engagement more deeply with those insights. So um, I think it's the stage is yours. So we'll let you uh, take it away. Welcome, everyone. We're going to go through a high level continuation of the previous conversation on decolonization of science process methodology and management within the context of regenerative agriculture thinking. And to be clear, there is a lot in the previous two presentations that are, is, is um, critical in order to understand the the points that we're going to go through today. Now, the there will be a lot of questions. I am assuming because of when when we address these kinds of large scale issues and conceptual uh, frameworks, there is a lot of um, detail that needs to be worked out. So a lot of that detail has been also um, addressed in previous presentations. Not all of it. This you know business of systems change is quite extensive and complex. Uh, so today we're going to focus on just thinking through the mindsets, the processes that we use to, and the methodology that defines how we manage our, our presence as, as organisms of the earth within the ecosystems that we inhabit and so on. And so you will find that we will be addressing yeah, you know, specific issues as to property, plant and equipment management. When do we bring equipment? Um, to what end? Uh, when does nature needs us to do those things? And how are we approaching this from a conquering, colonizing, extraction perspective? Or are we seeing it from a you know, perspective where we are part of the system that we are working with instead? So to that end, there are certain key outcomes that we need to be familiar with. And in this case, when we look at, you know, um, regenerative agriculture, there are some, some things that we assume uh, to be regenerative when they are not. They are, they are not necessarily part of a regenerative framework. They are just simply part of our colonized uh, ways of being, which is, it comes natural in, uh, to us and is also uh, more of the MO that we all are accustomed to and trained into and domesticated into. So in this case, when we look at the acceptance as perpetration of extractive and exploitative practices, I mean, think of organic farming, for example, is not conventional completely, but it's still conventional. It's still about row crops, about combining animals, and so on. It's still about extracting value and exploiting uh, the space and all of that. I'm not saying it's good or bad. Simply I'm saying those are facts, those are indicators that we are still using a colonizing uh, process in, when we design and engineer agronomical processes and economics and management and so on. Community social and economic independence is compromised. When we operate as individual farms, our whole community and social infrastructure and our interdependence with other species and also with other farms is compromised. And there is a tremendous challenge uh, in trying to work with farmers within collective systems. Most farmers are, are really radically individualistic. And so that is a colonized way of thinking as well as the result of a colonizing culture that we act that way. The legitimization and legalization of violence against anything that is counter to the system. So when we talk about ancestral traditions and knowledge and culture and food sovereignty and 
is, is most of the time relegated to those who are suffering minorities and so on and so forth because they are the ones who are in trouble. The rest is uh, somehow okay. Well, no, it isn't. We're not okay as a society. Uh, so this legitimization of violence uh, also somehow we use it to legitimize our attitudes or when it comes down to talking about uh, food sovereignty, justice, injustice, and, um, and uh, diversity and so on. The legalization of abuse of government sponsored corporate takeovers and market manipulation. I mean, this is, this is a day-to-day -day stuff. We're looking at government sponsoring corporations to take over whole countries' food systems uh, or whole regions or, or industry sectors. And then the, those corporations, you know, manipulate their way into into creating artificial markets, but then make it infinitely impossible for real farmers to succeed. So really important because that is at the core of colonizing structures that we have been building for a long time. The, that also results in the concentration of ownership and control of whole systems. I mean, we're no longer looking at farms. We're looking at the whole system from who owns the brands all the way through who owns the capital, who owns the infrastructure that produces that capital, and also the concentration of ownership and control on those elements of the system that make money versus the, the offloading of all of the risky aspects of the system to unsuspecting farmers, workers, and so on. That's a really important indicator of a colonized culture that is actually getting us to this brink of, um, you know, global collapse. The systematization of repression of indigenous knowledge and science. I mean, we tend to always want to um, verify. So is it scientifically proven, right? So say we are doing poultry with the, with the foundational indigenous knowledge that we inherited and we're putting poultry back into their natural environment where they evolved over millions of years. And yeah, that's indigenous knowledge and that's indigenous science. And it is proven and tested to be more effective and to be superbly effective and efficient. Yet it has to be somehow tested and verified by the conventional community of science, scientist community in order for, for it to be real yet it's more real than the recent inventions of, of colonizing science and management. Uh, so we don't, we don't require that, say, Monsanto, Monsanto scientifically, you know, or, or Bayer in this case, scientifically demonstrates that their chemicals will not harm and instead enhance the ecosystems if used, yet we demand and we don't accept indigenous knowledge, which is proven and tested for hundreds of thousands of years to enhance the environment and to feed people. So very important, uh, you know, uh, systems of repression that we have built into our narrative and in our management systems. Now, at the end, what this, this results in the uprooting of spiritually grounding traditions, individually raising to the bottom, consumerism, climate disruption, ecological collapse, war, conflict, disease, and social breakdown. I mean, if you are not seeing those indicators scream at us from everywhere and every corner of the earth right now, um, then uh, we are in the wrong room. Now, there are some, also some key outcome indicators of a decolonized regenerative agriculture system. And we'll, we'll look into a few things that uh, hopefully shifts your paradigm in a second here. But one of them is that natural resources are managed in perpetuity, not extracted for short-term gains. And it also happens that managing ecosystems in perpetuity is at the end more conducive to, reg to generating wealth than the extraction short-term uh, gains that we can achieve through exploitative colonizing systems. Now, the difference is that when natural resources are managed in perpetuity, a corporation can't just come and extract all the value from an ecosystem, walk away and leave the locals to, to pay and the 
communities at, at large to pay for the consequences of the extraction of that value. Now, they may only be extracting 5% of what we could extract in perpetuity, but they do it right away and they are very efficient at it. And that somehow is validated more above the more wealth creation and the more well being that we can generate if we manage resources in perpetuity under a decolonized process of management. The social and economic independence is supported as a foundation of success. If that is true, then you know you are not in a completely colonized um, setting. Ancestral traditions, knowledge, wisdom are validated to ensure collective mental, physical, and spiritual well being. This is central to indigenous ways of farming and living, community building, governance, ownership, control. Governance, organizing, and production infrastructure reflect community needs and priorities for collective wealth creation and distribution. It is not about someone making a profit. It's about everyone being collectively wealthier. And that, at the end of the day, generates a much better quality of life. When resources are distributed on the basis of how the, the governance infrastructure is built, then the management of all of that wealth is also done differently. And because of that, more people benefit and there is more, uh, you know, less conflict, less war, less of all kinds of these kinds of things that we are seeing under the colonizing systems we live today. Now, all supply chains from land to fork are collectively controlled and governed. You don't have a single company owning the whole supply chain and dumping all of the high risk assets onto farmers, such as the uh, as a land and property, plant and equipment in this case. Um, defending, protecting, enhancing collective interests is structured within the system level governance structures at all levels. At this point, we're talking about indigenous governance systems that have survived in the case of Guatemala over 500 years of colonization and are still defending and protecting and enhancing the interests of the communities that are within those territories. So that is because though we still have some of those incredibly structurally sound and also resilient uh, governing structures from ancestral traditions. Uh, the current governing systems have, have paired up completely with the extractive system that is destroying the very foundation of what they are governing. So when you focus on this, um, kind of outcomes, you will recognize a regenerative system when you see it. The verifiers are simple. Spiritual traditions are uplifted. Um, I'm sorry that the, the, I, I, I got this whole thing in, a, in the wrong order. So just stick with me. Ownership, control, and governance are co a collective affair. Okay? You don't have a board of directors of a nonprofit or a corporation that is actually, or even a country's government that is actually in control of the whole system. It is a collective affair. If, if you see that, then the system is regenerative. If not, it isn't. Meeting basic food needs of communities and regions is the priority. Not the production of cocoa for export or coffee for export or corn and soybeans or, it's not about the practices on the land. I mean, that is part of it, of course, but it's regenerative outcomes can be verified, are verified from a whole different angle when you look at it from a decolonized perspective. The environment is protected locally and globally. But why? Because if you pollute the Mississippi River up, up all the way up north in the Itasca, Itasca Park, for example, that pollution is going to go down the Mississippi all the way to New Orleans, all the way to the Gulf of Mexico, and then from there spread across the globe. So the whole issue of environmental management, ecological management, it isn't, it, 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 it's a global priority, it's a global management plan, and then verified, yes, locally. Resilience, not profits, and extraction is a central system level goal. But why, why not profits? Because we don't really need to make profits to feed the world. The, the communities have fed themselves for centuries, thousands of years, by exchanging the value of the different things that they, they generate. And yes, exchanging value is the term. So, but not profits necessarily, because profit is a term that is, is completely connected to extracting something out of something else 
owned by someone else normally. That's the case. So social rule, central accountability, interdepend and interdependency. Well, this is where the accountability then moves in, moves us into the um, the um, the objectives of the of the system. So governance, for example, is the result of accountability. Who owns and controls? That's the result of accountability. And 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 so on. You know, health focuses on well-being rather than the management of disease. Now, think about the the whole thing we have right now with uh, diet-related diseases in the United States. And I can remember, it was like 10 years that I heard that it was over $400 billion um, cost to the society. Now, why, why, why would you really manage a disease that shouldn't exist in the first place, right? And again, the, the health of a community is not, it's not measured by the absence of disease but the ability of the organisms in that community to resist and bounce back from disease. That is called well-being. And that is a foundational principle of, of health management, not managing diseases, which is where we focus the colonial, the colonizing processes. No, wealth is built and shared, not extracted. Delivering nutrition is not simply food or fill, it's the top system priority. So, Delivering nutrition is the top system priority. Notice it's not about food, it's about nutrition. The system simply is or isn't regenerative. Certifications or outside control schemes are unnecessary and they are also irrelevant for a system to be regenerative. If it is, then it's regenerating. If it isn't, it isn't regenerating. It doesn't matter if anybody has certified it, labeled it, uh, built a brand around it, put all these claims on it, that doesn't matter. It's either regenerative or it's not, simple as that. The focus is also on the system level indicators, outcomes as products from a farm or farm practices are simply not regenerative on their own because only systems can regenerate. That is a fundamental mistake we're making today on how we are approaching this aspect of regenerative thinking because we are still using colonizing practices, management, science, and methodology to enter this space. And instead of enhancing the ability and preparing ourselves in our own approaches to optimize the incredible, magnificent, uh, benefits of regenerative ways, we are instead colonizing this space, appropriating it, labeling it, naming it, and then building infrastructure to protect whatever it is that we think it is, rather than just allowing it to be regenerative. So, understanding decolonization, you know, this is really critical because as I just what I just said results out of a mental process that we are indoctrinated into and domesticated into. So the first step here is the, the discovery. You, know, you, you heard this before, right? It's a new land, it's new people, it's a new concept, it's a new story. This new discovery then is named. Then after it's named, it's legally appropriated and expropriated from those who have preserved it. In this case, the, the, the whole idea of, of how we regenerate ecosystems uh, held together, or, you know, despite the incredible forces of colonization and repression, held by native communities who are still practicing indigenous ways across the world. Uh, according to the UN, over 80% of the biodiversity on the planet is held under indigenous communities, uh, native communities. Why? Because they have always were operated on, on mostly decolonized processes. And so this legal appropriation and expropriation is happening to that concept of regenerative thinking right now as well. Um, the standardization and scale repression, ownership and control systems. Think about what we are doing by, uh, what we did to organic by bringing it under a government institution. Now corporations can decide what organic is and isn't and to a great extent. And because of that, we have still animals in confinement and, and, and and we still got corn and soybeans and row crops and tilling and 
you know, a, a release of CO2 into the air and in an and organic manner into the water systems and excess um, um, fertilizers and inputs, uh, organic or not, they, they still destroy the balance of life on the ecosystem. So this is important to understand as we think about what the difference is between, you know, conventional, regenerative, and organic, and all this other uh, terminology that is thrown around all over the place. Now, build systems, the, 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 the process of colonization, you know, optimizes the, the last piece, which is the, what I call the colonization of the mind, where, where the systems to repress indigenous thinking and attempts at indigenizing ways of living and intellect are actually uh, consolidated with the purpose of invalidating, you know, in fact, scientifically invalidating or co-opting indigenous knowledge, the subsidization, the subsidizing of pseudo solutions, such as, you know, genetically engineered crops and things like that, at the cost of real and permanent well-being and progress. So to understand decolonization, then you got to revert that process in your head. You know, we need to go back and rediscover Aboriginal systems and and so on, ideas, concepts, stories, names of places, and, and start reversing that in, in our heads, but also in the day-to-day -day practices. We need to rename these things, to reclaim and re insecure. So if we're going to name something, uh, a way of uh, doing things, uh, such as regenerative, let's not define it, but rather let's just rename it. It's indigenous agriculture, actually. Indigenous, not from the perspective of people who are native to Minnesota or, or to my, my native country in Guatemala, but rather are indigenous to the earth, right? This is a way of farming, of thinking, of managing the, our relationship as beings of the earth, in, you know, as, as beings of the earth that depend on all life on earth. And so as we become more indigenous with our own nature, then we can I absorb this concept and we can start, you know, uh, either, even naming it. We may name it a hundred or a thousand different ways, as long as the concept, the idea, the story, the land, all of those things, the rituals, the traditions are actually uh, representative of a way of thinking that grounds us back with the original geoevolutionary processes of the earth and the magnificent design that we were delivered for the transformation of energy from non-edible into edible forms through biophysical and chemical processes that have existed forever and that are more than tested to deliver sufficient food for all of us. So rebuild community governance and protection systems. We're gonna address this in the last uh, of this series, uh, indigenizing governance. We, we, we have been you know, bringing this back as a process of, of, um, of um, systematizing decolonization processes where governance and the re-indigenization of it, the holistic governing six systems and so on are, are central. A standardizing processes to reclaim and return original systems to their original purpose. The purpose of a system and food uh, from an indigenous perspective is really to support the holistic thinking, appreciation and enjoyment of life, design and engineer to ensure the full expression of all living organisms is materialized. Now, it just happens that all of that is already going on. We don't have to be engineering a lot of the stuff that we are engineering. All we need to is understand how it was already engineered and by nature itself and ensure that every organism, you know, expresses itself in the fullest potential that it was given through the geoevolutionary processes. And what it means is simply, you know, accepting that a corn plant may not produce 400 bushels of corn per acre if uh, managed in a more holistic way. And that is not a measure of inefficiency or it's not an indicator of inefficiency. For efficiency in agriculture and in in, in, in under a decolonized process is measured not on the output of product and pounds and stuff, but rather the throughput in the transformation ratios of energy within a system. And so this is, um, this is an area where we're gonna have to expand a lot more in the, in, you know, and we expanded a little bit more on the previous presentation. You can go back and, and, and watch that, that part of energy management and its stewardship as a foundation of our relationship to food rather than producing things. 
So expand and organize new systems. So we need to scale up organizing across communities, locally, regionally, and nationally. We need to build aggregation of representation from local localized governing councils all the way across the board until we reach the national levels of building, you know, a regenerative Congress, agricultural Congress or something like that, that is actually grown up from the, the communities that are embracing regenerative uh, ways. So basically, Regenerative thinking is a radical, um, is a is a radical perspective. It's a nature-based foundation. It is subversive. Uh, it's, it's, it's it happens when we become intellectually insurgent. So what we need is an intellectual insurgency so that we can flip the paradigms on which we operate and build the systems with the integrity and commitment. When you think as an insurgent, then that integrity and that commitment become the thing that drives you forward. We need that level of passion that an insurgent is characterized by in order to actually achieve this decolonization goal. The beauty of it is that this the regenerative is an evolutionary process because it ignites engagement at scale. There is no better time in the history of human beings where we need this engagement at scale under structures and organizational processes that allows us permanence. I'm not talking about scale as in protesting and then going home but rather scale as in, as in liberating the, the consumer from conventional products, the land from conventional practices, as from bank debt at the farm, and on and on it goes. Um, evolutionary, uh, we can adapt, we are agile, we are resilient. When you, when you operate under a regenerative framework, these characteristics are, are the uh, part of the, um, what defines what you do. This is how we arrive at this uncompromising destination called regenerative. So no longer think of regenerative agriculture as no-till or soil health or, or rotational crops or th those are practices that they are important. They are critical in transitioning uh, towards regenerative. They are, I mean, they are all, all good. Uh, they are not the destination though. A regenerative destination is way, way, way beyond that. Now, here's a quick view for one, one process that we have followed um, in, in terms of how we approach poultry from this indigenized, decolonized way of seeing and working with these systems. You know, first of all, we saw the, the landscape uh, from the perspective of the chicken, a landscape. The chicken wants shade, it wants canopy, it wants to be protected from the sun, aerial predators. Uh, it's, it's, um, it wants to have a sheltered or a protected area to sleep on. Normally they will do it on trees, blah, blah, blah. It's a long story, but that's the way we started the process of engineering. Rather than um, thinking of from a homocentric perspective, what would we, how can we grow and produce chickens? Rather than thinking it that way, we said, what would make the chicken express its maximum potential as an organism? And that's how we ended up with our current design. And our current design really goes back to the foundational currency of farming, which is carbon. The, the process of managing that so that we can achieve efficiency. Efficiency not in necessarily measured in productivity or or pounds of chicken per acre or per building, but rather transformation of energy. And so when we think of it that way, we also achieve the outcomes we want, the pounds and all of that, and exceed the expectations. But when we focus on the pounds as a beginning point, then we go quickly into heat conversion rates and we get locked into that 5% of possibilities for innovation. And we ignore the other 95% that could come from a decolonized point of view. The naturally occurring energy transformation systems is really the foundational production engineering management sciences uh, in regenerative agronomics. Uh, think about agronomics in the poultry system we are deploying now. Uh, you won't find a lot of that traditional, you know, linear recipe-like uh, process. Rather, what you have is a lot of indicators, observations, and knowledge and wisdom building formulas so that we can actually interpret what's going on so that we know whether that chicken is actually uh, 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 achieving that optimal state of performance as an organism 
And as a result, you know, we can have more margins, lower cost, less work, and so on. Uh, and then governance, the integration of local, regional, and national collective enterprises so that we can move the management systems into the structure that allows us to, to govern um, collectively, but also achieve the scale, level, scale levels that gives us that competitive advantage in management and so on. At that point, we can use a lot of the colonized sciences because the science itself is not what's bad. The, the corporate structure is not necessarily what's bad. It's the people and the objectives and, and to what end those systems and tools are used. That's what is wrong today. And fortunately for all of us, it's a very small amount of corporate executives and folks around the world that actually dominate the colonizing system. So to actually change it, as long as all of us get together and start doing this, they really don't mean very much. They get all the money right now because we give it to them, but it is just, uh, just a, as he was given can be taken away. Here is the process by which we structure a, a, a multi-dimensional way of thinking about the chicken. The three places where energy is transformed at a mass scale on the earth is one, the photosynthetic processes of plants. So the more photosynthesis, photosynthetic surfaces in your farm, the more effectively you are, you are achieving that first level of transformation of free accessible, uh, freely accessible energy in the air and all around us photons and so on, and then bringing them into that space that you are now overseeing from an energy transformation perspective. The second place of transformation on mass scale, on a mass scale is the, the intestinal gut and the chewing mechanisms of animals. So whether it's cows and sheep and pigs and so on and so forth. In this case, chickens, well, they don't have teeth in their beaks, but they do have uh, gizzards, which act as a chewing mechanism. And so that process breaks down molecular structures that are molecularly more difficult for microbes and other organisms to break apart and to, and to dissolve into the, the original uh, foundational nutrients. So that process in the intestinal gut and the animal's chewing mechanism is the next place that on a global perspective, the next level of energy transformation happens. And so as that happens, we get to harvest certain forms of energy such as eggs and fruits and nuts and all the things that we, we pick on the farm. Um, but it's not about production, it's about energy expressions. And so the next level of transformation happens in the soil where again, microorganisms, both at the, at the gut intestinal uh, microflora and the organisms of the, of the soil is the equivalent of the intestinal microflora in our, in our uh, guts. And so, those three places is where most of the energy is transformed on planet Earth. In between these processes, there is a magnificent assembly of millions of micro transformation uh, processes that are that resulted from the adaptation of micro and, and large scale ecosystems over geological time and governed by the laws of thermodynamics that define the biophysical and chemical um, uh, processes that go into ensuring that this energy is endlessly transformed and endlessly being put into in bark, into feathers, into eggs, into vegetables, into nuts and fruits and so on and so forth. That system never stops to the extent that that energy is freely allowed to flow and or is at least not interrupted as much as we are doing today. And as long as each of the organisms in this whole system, including ourselves, are expressing the maximum Earth-given genetic potential, we don't need much of the engineering that we have, we have done today to colonize the world. The engineering we have done is mostly for the purpose of profit and extraction of it, not for the purpose of feeding the world. That, that if, if anybody doesn't have that clear yet, um, meditate on that. Um, so anyway, out of these processes, we get to harvest energy in different expressions. Some of it is not immediately edible. So it goes back into the process again and again, and then becomes different expressions of energy. You know, like the, the manure the, from our chickens is taken out of the barns and then put into different agroforestry systems so we can generate grains and vegetables and medicinal herbs I and mean, anything in the grocery store uh, pretty much or on your table every day. Some of that energy comes back into the system 
And that is how we see energy transformation as a foundation of the efficiency in agriculture. Now, it just happens that according to some scientific scientist partners that, that I work with, that we estimate that no more than 30 to 40% of the energy that is uh, um, processed in this cycle needs to, is actually harvestable immediately, which means that 60 to 70% of the energy that is captured in the cycles is put into the system for the next cycle, which means we start energy rich, so meaning wealthy, if we understand that energy uh, is the currency of agriculture. Basically what I'm saying is we don't operate on flat or linear uh, equations, flat surfaces or linear equations. We think of the landscape as three-dimensional first, starting from way down under the ground where the deepest roots can reach all the way to the top so that we can optimize the, the, the every organism capacity to be the best it can be and to process the most energy possible. If we do that right, then we will add and we will automatically become connected to the fourth dimension to this space and organisms, which is the spiritual aspect. When we would connect on the spiritual level, then we can achieve the three-dimensional view and the three-dimensional capacity to transform or support the process of transformation of energy. And as a result of that, achieve what many are calling the triple bottom line for, for the, the, the economic, social, and ecological outcomes are not in isolation. They happen when we are able to see this three-dimensionality and as a result of that, connect spiritually, then we can achieve a triple bottom line. And feed our families the healthiest foods you could ever find. So this next aspect is really about just um, taking all of this from the land, from the farms and building collective uh, assemblies of all of these different expressions of us. So whether we are farming chickens or vegetables, we are part of these affinity groups that can be layered all across the landscape to build a collective impact on the basis that those affinity groups have common goals and objectives. And measuring the wealth creation um, on the basis of indicators of collective well-being. So in Southeastern Minnesota, for example, where we are working right now with 20 farms of which 11 are BIPOC community members, we are measuring our collective wealth at just around $32 million in property, plant, and equipment, and probably up to 20 million in intellectual uh, property and uh, brand value and all of that. So we are right now collectively sitting on around 52 to $60 million worth of collective uh, wealth. And what that means is that uh, we are achieving a level of collective well-being. For example, when we feel depressed or when we don't have enough time to do the work on the farm, uh, such as last weekend when I needed to plant 10,000 hazelnuts, there were over 15 of our partners in the region that came out and we were able to plant all of the 28, 21 acres of hazelnuts in three days. That's a collective well-being. Why? Because I'm not suffering mental depression or any of those other problems um, individually. Why? Because I have a collective wealth that we can tap into when we uh, have a little deficit like that. That's a very different concept and it's very hard for traditional linear economists to understand what it means to actually operate in a circular economy. Thinking, designing for and building at scale. We're not compromising scale in any way. In fact, we can design systems that can deliver much larger scale than the current conventional uh, system. And we, we can share the numbers with you on that too. But we don't compromise the small scale, why? Because in this case, for example, these folks from an urban community in our region came to the farm, bought the chickens at $8, uh, and then processed them because we have equipment that they can use. We took all of the byproducts, put them back into the layering composting systems that we use. We're able to utilize 100% of the chicken 
but more importantly, these families who have traditionally uh, used the whole chicken, they understand that the value of the chicken isn't in the breast, it's actually in the thigh, the dark meat, and especially the medicinal value is in the giblets. So the heart, the liver, the gizzard, all of those parts that are discarded, that's where most of the value for some of us is. This way, they were able to walk away with about $30 worth of value for each chicken they purchased at eight, and which would have sold, you know, if they had bought that chicken in the market, they would have gotten not only, uh, not only would they have had to pay about $22, $22 for that chicken, but they would have gotten about 30 to 35% less value in terms of nutritional quality. So this way, we can actually deliver food that is so inexpensive. Keep in mind, inexpensive, not cheap. Is the most, ex most expensive food in terms of nutritional value delivered at the least expensive cash value at $8. In general terms, this is cheaper um, or less expensive to a family in the inner city than Tyson chicken that is gonna make them sick or that it, or other kinds of chicken that is actually loaded with uh, antibiotics and, and, and pharmaceuticals of all kinds, and also loaded with exploitation of people and pollution of the water systems and so on and so forth. So who, who, whichever brand is coming out of conventional systems out there is never going to be able to deliver the kind of nutrition that we can deliver this way at the cost that we can deliver. But now this is a whole different aspect of food access thinking from a decolonized perspective. And yes, people have to do their part. These families came to the farm. If they're not willing to do that, I don't know how an inner city family is ever going to expect that high quality nutritious food is going to be delivered to them at a um, affordable price uh, without having to go back and recreate systems of subsidies and all of that and remove the dignity that comes with regenerative being. So the next layer beyond the farm is mobile units. We have one of these in, in a Pine Ridge Reservation in partnership with my coach agricultural systems. They can process up to 2,000 chickens in a day on one of these units. And the next step, again, layering the scalability of things, uh, we bought a processing facility in Stacyville, Iowa, uh, collectively between all of us in the region last year and now is deployed to pr pr process up to 1 million chickens. And then the next layer, we partnered with the state of Minnesota and the city of Butler Lee to deploy a regionally branded regenerative agriculture development park where we can do up to 10 million chickens and at least 500 million eggs and about 14 other products that are um, generated as part of the poultry system. We also built a brand, it's called Treeland Chicken, and now we are deploying Treeland Farms. This is a collectively owned and managed uh, company, but it also integrates all, everything from grain production, grain processing, grain sprouting, poultry production, poultry processing, all the way to the distribution. At the end, what you really have is fully integrated systems rather than farms or products. And it's at this level that this system becomes regenerative. The product that comes out of this, of this system then can be regenerative. But a single product through a linear supply chain it simply doesn't, doesn't add up from a regenerative perspective. So as you go, think of this fundamental elements of decolonizing all of these processes, management, science, and systems that we have put together. If you're a farmer, farm, but be a producer no more. Be a steward of energy transformation. Engage money if you're in the financial sector. But be an extractor of wealth no more. Be a partner and allied in building collective wealth. If you work for justice and equality, be a savior no more. Be an insurgent in your own colonized world and change from within. Buy food, but be a consumer no more. Be a steward of your body, your mind, and your spirit, and we all be better off because of it.
and we have gone through 45 minutes and I don't even know if anybody's listening. So let's check. I've been listening <laughs> with great attention. I, I uh, continue to think you're brilliant. Um, and um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping people feel sufficiently, um, <clears throat> Yeah, there's a few comments coming into the chat. Yes, people are expressing positive, <laughs> positive responses. I, I was just trying to think about how to how to say this. Um, the bar that you hold is is so high that um, I think we all can hopefully see where we can do better. Um, I think a lot of times when you hear presentations or or concepts and people want to feel like they're part of the in group. Um, there's this sort of, okay, now I'm good enough. I'm one of these people. I'm superior. I've, 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 I've arrived, but it's, it's so, it's so, um, it's so comprehensive and so, and so, um, revolutionary. Um, I just, I really, really appreciate your, the, the place it comes from and the, um, yeah, the call, the call, the call to rise to that, to that level. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm happy to engage engage questions. We, I mean, 45 minutes of conversation um, is probably better if people are up for it. So um, I can start with a couple of the things that have been posted here, but um, anybody who's would like to engage with questions, please put them in the Q and A. Um, so Roger asked, uh, what are examples of success? The Maori in New Zealand, that was about 25 minutes ago. I think you certainly expect Expressed quite profoundly what you're doing with the you know chickens in the Midwest. It's really impressive. Um, did you say how many pounds that eight dollar chicken was? If you did that, um, no, but it was all of our chickens weighed between three point seventy five and four point two five pounds, and and in this case, that specific picture was taken out of dressed chickens that were four point closer to 4.5 because they included giblets and all of the actual edible parts rather than just the carcass. So those are four and a half plus pound packages. And they're certified organic or certifiably organic. Well, so now we are certifying because a client is willing to pay the premium for certification, but we have always been certifiable. All of our protocols meet the certification. We always make sure of that. And then we certify when when consumers actually care about that. I but I, the point I want to make is that you are able to economically produce certified organic chicken at two dollars a pound. I mean, for any um, business for a while, that's ridiculous. Not to be calm. Yeah, somewhere in there. I mean, we're not. We are because we have we internalize all of the costs. We're not we're not dumping any cost on anyone. So. I couldn't give you the specific number because right now we are at 30% higher, higher grain values. Mm -hmm. um, so it, the, the price just significantly changed this uh, spring. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, if you talk about afford affordably, affordably producing chicken that is free of confinement, free of antibiotics, free of everything we don't want and full of everything we want, uh, we are probably your most competitive chicken out anywhere. I, the, the picture behind you is, I mean, exactly what I saw when I went to your house. That's what it looks like. They're not in houses. They're not, you know, I mean, they're not confined except by a fence that's of an acre, of an acre and a half. It's it's really right. quite inspiring. Um, and I, I don't know if people <clears throat> have grokked that, but I, I, I certainly, <laughs> as someone who's been raising chickens for, I don't know, 35 years or something, um, you, know, you really, I feel like, have... have... Yeah, and, and think, keep in mind that our... our our methodology and our management process is, is, is grounded on some very simple principles. Like for example, when we design something, we always ask everybody to think about it from a perspective of being allergic to work. Yeah. So if you have to work, find a way not to. That's not the point. We don't want to work. Now, if we have to work on something, then let's make sure that that work is done in the mo in the easiest, most most pleasant and more enjoyable possible way. And yeah. that those are simple things that have incredibly transformed the way we actually operate our farms. It's actually really enjoyable. 
It's and clutter, clutter because that's all you're doing because the system's in place and you're just doing a little bit here and a little bit there and it's not hard. Yes, we're not hauling chicken tractors across for a few chickens. We Our flocks are 1,500 broilers per flock. Yeah. And those chickens don't even like people because they have never had to be close to us. They are as, as naturally behaving as possible. They got a canopy of trees that, that those hazelnuts produce between three and four times more hazelnuts over the chickens than on the, where there is no chickens. Those the hazelnuts are also expressing their full capacity. The ground, I mean, we had soil scientists, geologists, we had all these people come out and they're like kids in a candy store when they come out to evaluate the soil here. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, that is beautiful. There is no need for us to be stressed out about work or getting up at 5 a.m. every day. I mean, I don't really like that. I was I was a laborer. I grew up in poverty. I had to work from sunup to sundown every single day and go home still hungry and poor. I don't like the idea of work. So if I can avoid it, believe me, I'll avoid it. And that probably is our greatest competitive advantage because it just happens that most of your capital on the farm goes, in this case, for poultry, goes into feed and labor. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to go back to this question, what are examples of success? And um, Roger asked about the Maori in New Zealand. I don't know if in this presentation you have, I mean, you've referred to it, um, and because I've talked to you in the past, I, I think I know what you're saying, but I mean, you in, in today you also talked about the, the, you know, the culture in Guatemala where you grew up and how that is still operating along these principles. And you I think referenced I'm not sure who it was, some international agency that said 80% of biodiversity on the planet is um, on land where the people living there are still indigenous in their mindset. So, I mean, there's examples of this globally, but are there things you want to say specifically about your experience in Guatemala or other things, other models where people can see uh, or understand where, where this sort of alternate paradigm is, is, is dominant? Yeah, no, for example, we have um, Era and Iota, those two, they're not girlfriends. They're actually two hurricanes that hit Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador last, uh, the end of last year in October. Now, it happens that some of the communities we work with are so remote and there are so many rivers in between and all the bridges were taken out. Uh, so those communities actually reported having having just, they protected the chickens and they fed the chickens because that was their source of at least one egg a day for every person for a few months while the roads reopened and all of that. And it was something that they, they, they could feed them herbs, they could harvest the, the forest, they could do so many other things. They had so many more options because of that. That's a success story to us. Um, we also just launched the Regente Poultry Cooperative in southeastern Minnesota, all led by minority, uh, mostly you know, us Hispanic, Latino, um, uh, African Americans, and Asian uh, farmers. And then the, you know, fully inclusive of a lot of the white farmers in our region, of course, but you know, led by us only because we seem to be more connected to that indigenousness, and these folks were were interested in that, so they joined and. Of course, we're welcoming them too, but that is another level of success. Why? Because we have succeeded, not necessarily because we built a co-op and now we're gonna, you know, we are raising one and a half million dollars and more people will have access to land and we'll get more and more cash flow. That's not a measure of success. The measure of success for us is the fact that we are able to liberate about, in this case, about 1 million chickens from confinement about, I know, calculate how much pharmaceuticals are no longer gonna be part of that. And we are liberating a very large network of people who would have been enslaved and meat packers in other places while having all this wealth of knowledge and capacity. Those are the success stories for us. That's how we measure success. Now, if we break even, that's like fourth in the list. It's important, of course. But breaking even for us is a whole different concept. I, I can't use a regular BEP formula because it doesn't have enough lines to include all of the value we create. And so as we think of success, those are, those are the, 
the, the indicators that we are succeeding. It's when people are liberated from, from stationary, exploitative, inhuman conditions. Every person is a success story uh, that comes out of a factory farm or a factory meat packer. Every farmer who, instead of you know, being limited and discriminated against, now owns and operates a farm uh, that they can market where, where they can grow three chickens. Uh, that's a success story. Every chicken that is now in the market that is not coming from a conventional system, that's a success story. So we have so many success stories that uh, we will need a bonfire in some more time to tell you all of them. But also <laughs> we have built a super competitive uh, system level scale solution. That is also a success story. But most of the time people will start there. Uh, that for us is the total outcome of the individual success stories that collectively aggregated uh, signify a system level success. Brilliant. And I, I would just say what is coming to my mind right now is the comment you made about, you know, if you're a, um, you know, if you're a farmer, don't, you know, harvest crops anymore, be a steward of, of energy. If you're a, you know, you work with money, don't be a, um, extractor, you know, how, however you frame that, I'm sorry, I don't have it um, integrated yet into my, into my subconscious. But I think, I mean, you made the point about um, how we the people are actually giving our power to the corporate system, you know, by purchasing these products. And, and, you know, and we and we can we can give it and we can take it away. I think, you know, from some foundational perspective, the responsibility that each of us has and how we choose to engage the supply chain is the way the world has changed. And, you know, it's it's great to have these philosophical conversations and sort of hopefully be inspired and and you know, um, you know, insights are coming to you. But 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 walking the talk thereafter, um, you know, for all of us is is uh, you know, I think where we need to be grounding this. So just to, just to just to make that point. Um, I'm not sure if you want to say anything about that before I go to the next question. Oh, well, also how how actually easy it is. Now yeah. I came to this country in 1993, technically, and immediately after I arrived, I made contact with farmers, I made contacts with uh, grocery stores that sold organic uh, products and all of that. And I think since I lived here from since 1993 forward, I have never given profits to conventional corporations in the food sector beyond emergency basis. And if they have a role, maybe emergency basis. If you're but, and you're hungry but and if you're we, a rental car. And I, I am not malnourished, I am not unhealthy. I actually, all I am well nourished and healthy and mentally healthy, which took a long time to get to because of the consequences of the war and all of that. But yet I totally, totally, believe and I have I am proof that everything I laid out for you is not only possible it is better when you do that because you do achieve the full expression of yourself and who on this earth doesn't want to be the full expression of themselves yeah Beautiful. now if you don't want to that's fine then uh don't be but <laughs> I am trying to <laughs> just kidding your, your your passion and vitality is 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 infectious it's it's, it's hard it's hard to do <laughs> Thing. Um, I'm going to proceed forward here with some questions. Uh, Chris uh, says, uh, Reggie, I'm completely intrigued by your discussion of organizational models for creating collective value and collective impact at multiple scales. Where would you point us to learn more about the details of designing these types of organizations? Oh boy. Um, there is actually, anybody in the group is part of the food, the um, forum for the future. Food Forum for the Future, um, organized by this organization out of England, because she actually just sent a whole list of resources answering that very question, because I actually never cared to, to look around very much. So I was going to, maybe I should just send it to you, um, and then you can distribute to some if of those folks. Link, if you can yeah. find a link and post it in the chat, then everybody is. Yeah. I, oh, it's a, it's a whole pile of them, but let me... Um, let me just um, look for it while while we take other questions. Okay. Um, <clears throat> oops, somebody already just put it on here. Shire Regenerative Farm. 
just put it to the panelists, looks like. Oh, okay. So okay. see if, um, if you can see the last update that the director out of England sent out uh, was talking about the, um, the, this resources uh, on circular economy, collective, collective management and so on. And they're not calling it what I call it, but that doesn't matter. The name yep. doesn't matter, it's the outcome. <laughs> All right, um, Greg asked, um, well says, you are going forward with tree range chickens. How can we do the same in our own areas, in this case, Southern California, or can we join your collective? Yes, no, it's a very, very methodically structured takeover plan, uh, <laughs> literally. So, <laughs> the, so the way we operate is, it's pretty simple. You have to go to, go to that link, regionpoultry.com, um, get in touch with us. And what we'll do is, instead of us taking our chicken to you, we will work with you as an operating partner. And then you build a system like the one we built in Southeastern Minnesota in your own region. So yeah. those operating partners have a high level of business development and ecosystem management responsibility, but we will transfer all of that to you. And it will take a little bit. It will be slower at the beginning. It's not like just setting up chicken coops and, and processors and all of that. Those are important, but if you start from there, then you just flip back into that colonizing mentality. Yeah. So, so it's critical that we, that we, um, we talk about it offline. We have a methodology, a process, and an organic way for building regional systems. And then our goal is to build at least one regional system per state in the, all of the 48 continental um, um, territory of the United States, the 48 states. So once we do that, the goal is to reach at least 5% of the total eggs and broilers that are consumed. Technically, we consume about 20 chickens and 20 dozen eggs a year in this country. We want us as an ecosystem, as a national ecosystem of tree range farmers to capture one of the egg, a dozen eggs and one of the chickens as a pivoting point to tip over and then from there actually scale to more regenerative uh, levels. Brilliant. Um, okay, uh, Dara asks, uh, when are prices going down? For families with three, four and six, kids dozens of eggs a week at six dollars per dozen is out of reach premium pricing is a huge barrier that scares off support i think we talked about this with your pounds dollars per pound on the on the chicken itself but are you are you selling your eggs at six six dollars a dozen no that's what retailers sell them at. so basically we also have a dysfunctional system that increases the cost of of the goods unnecessarily in some cases necessarily in others some farmers are, are increasing the cost of their eggs and chickens because, because honestly they are working too much. And yeah, I don't want them not to be paid for the for their work they're doing, but for the most part, we have found that we can, we can raise a flock, for example, on down to 80 hours per flock. When you know, some other farmers are using up to 300 uh, hours per flock and that's not, we shouldn't burden the consumer with that artificial cost that we are incurring because we are not being intelligent about how we manage our own you know, labor. So that's one way. It's a criticism, but also an encouragement to think deeper. Second, um, when, you know, we can produce a dozen eggs for about $1.90 uh, organic certified in up to $2.25 when it is actually very uh, expensive to raise them, whether it's because it's dry or because the feed went up uh, or so, and, or we had an incident, we lost chickens, whatever the, the case may be. So, but at that price, the, the egg is very affordable still. Now, I know not everybody can access direct to, from, the, from the farmers, but because we are building these farms across the landscape, the idea is that eventually people will have access directly to the farms uh, so that these eggs don't have to go through the supply chain and become and triple their value, their, their cost. Yeah. So that's one way to solve this. The other way is to really operate collectively at such a scale that we can move that product without artificially increasing 
the cost out of inefficiencies in the supply chain. I mean, the conventional system raises the price because they want more profit. So, you know, those, those organic confinement eggs, they don't have to sell at four and six dollars. They're just making a killing on it. Now in our ecosystem, collectively governed and managed, you know, we can be partners all the way from consumers to the farmers and we can all do better and including consumers paying only half of what they would normally be paying and still farmers having a decent living in, a, in an honorable way of retiring and so on. So yes, that, that's the way to organize this, but, but it will take some significant intellectual insurgencies and more regional, uh, regional capacity like the one we're building in the bordering region of Minnesota, Iowa and Wisconsin. And to be consumers no more, as you said, to not just see yourself as someone who goes to the store, but actually take responsibility for reintegrating, I mean, into the process. I mean, that's that's part of it is as long as you're colonized in that in that framework, that's probably what's going to be your experience. So that's, I mean, I've I got my rant about occupying the land and not everybody has to be a farmer, I understand. But you know, I think a lot of these solutions only occur as we deepen our relationship with the environment and nature. And community, um, we can't, we shouldn't expect them to, to sort of come sort of magically. It, it only comes through right. right. systemic engagement. Exactly. Uh, uh, Bill and Jay asked, "Are the hazelnuts for chickens to roost, human food, or feed?" The chickens don't roost on the hazelnuts. Um, we have made sure of that um, by trimming the bottom branches. If they start doing that, they destroy the plant. And um, the hazelnut is very happy to have the chickens under, but not on top. Uh, they do better. Uh, the, the other thing is hazelnuts are a precious product. So we, if we don't have to feed it to the chickens, we don't. Uh, we harvest them out of the trees and it's a product that needs to be roasted and processed. So it can be food grade, uh, be, even if it's coming from the chicken paddocks. Now, the um, as we scale up, uh, hazelnuts, yes, we are thinking of it as animal feed, but not for the chickens. See, the chickens, um, technically, they don't truly appreciate this kind of gourmet food. So, and we can feed them many other things. On the, on, instead, what we are doing is developing another line as we increase the production of hazelnuts. And we're going to be producing uh, hazelnut and acorn finished tree range pork. Nice. And they also provide shade, I think, is one of the key and protection from airborne predators. Right. Yes. Now, the, the hazelnut has evolved over millions of years, probably, um, uh, in its own ecosystem, right? So, they, they, for example, the hazelnut can harvest up to 300 pounds of nitrogen per acre. The root systems sprawl up to 15 feet in, in, you know, from the, you know, well, seven and a half feet in, in, in um, radius from the trunk of the tree. Uh, harvests about 80% of its, of its energy within the first eight to 12 inches of soil. And so it literally is an inverted umbrella to capture especially poultry manure. And so it's, it's uh, phenotypical characteristics also evolved to attract birds to their trunks so that they can attract the manure. And so just similar to Aronia attracting the buffalo and the deer to the wallows in the in the Great Plains so that they could thrive. Same thing, the hazelnut did the same thing and it became extremely smart at doing this. And so the chicken naturally recognizes this, the hazelnut recognizes it, and then they come uh, become a community there and they become, you know, so they feed on each other. So the hazelnut produces a very thick canopy. No hawk can see through that. And also it sprawls over, you know, in an umbrella like, because that's what the chicken needs in order to conglomerate in there. And then guess what? A scared chicken because a hawk is going on over. Guess what they do right after they run over and stop? They poop. So this is not coincidental. This is all magnificently designed. <laughs> and so all we are doing is reading it, learning from it, developing our our indigenous intellect by using this innate intelligence we were given at birth. And as a result of that, we see all of that 95% of innovations that we can bring about because we're not here to colonize the space. When you colonize, you operate on 5% of your capacity. When you decolonize, you access the other 95%, not only of the landscape capacity, 
but of your own capacity and your brain capacity, your physical capacity. It's just magnificent. That is the story of the hazelnut and the chicken. Wonderful. And I just want to bring up, I mean, as when I walked around your farm and saw what was going on, it wasn't just hazelnuts. You had, you know, um, comfrey and other things um, that were also critical ingredients in the in the paddock. So, I mean, I'm not sure if you want to share any of those specific details for people, but one of the other things that was also interesting to me was you said certain plants don't like chickens underneath them, like apples and peaches. Um, that was I, that's something I'd never known before I you know growing up <clears throat> we had the chickens in chicken tractors in the orchard or in paddocks in the orchard um, underneath fruit trees and you said that really is counterproductive so any any moment of insight on that topic which I don't right. think think think, think of it this way every organism has a blueprint that it's seeking to accomplish so whether it is a nutritional blueprint or in the case of northern climate, for example, deciduous trees drop their leaves. That's a blueprint they are embedded with. And they need certain conditions in the environment to achieve those, those steps in their process of living. So apples, for example, the, the, that whole family, uh, that whole species, uh, what do you call it, genus, uh, requires an amount of cold hours the plant has to accumulate a certain number of cold hours in the root system, especially, in order to set fruit, to hold it, to develop it, and to, to reproduce. And so what happens is with the broilers, the broilers conglomerate under the trees because that's where the shade is and that's where they get protection from the predators, right? Now, the other thing that happens as a result of that is that they lay on the ground and because they don't sweat, uh, they, the way they cool off is by sprawling and releasing the heat to the cool ground under the shade, which is around 70, 72, 74 degrees on an oval basis. Now, if, if their temperature out there is say 90 degrees and the temperature of the, um, the chicken body is 98 degrees, the temperature of the soil is 70 or 72, within the next two, three days, and then forward from there, the ground level temperature below the chicken breast when they're laying there is going to rise upwards of 86 degrees. And that's beyond what the apple in this case needs in order to cold on and accumulate it, its cold hours. And so, I mean, I learned about cold hours in agriculture school. And so when somebody told me in, in Guatemala, right? When somebody told me here that it was the chicken manure that was causing the problem, I said, I don't think so because there isn't enough defecation in there to actually affect the tree. In any case, it would benefit it. Oh no, because it heats up. Well, I took the temperature readings and no, it was not heating it up, but it did heat up when the chickens were laying under. So once we isolated that factor, that's when we learned, yeah, certain trees, uh, certain fruit trees that re have those requirements, they will not do well. So knowing the phenotypical and the genotypical characteristics and then the environmental requirements of a species is central so that you can reconcile the behavior of animals. And this is the plaque applicable, not just to the, to the broilers, but also to sheep and cows and, and all kinds of other livestock. It's, it's called indigenous intellect for a reason. And so the next step for us was to test egg layers because egg layers don't sit around. And so the, the apple trees took off again. That is the story of the chicken, the broiler, and the apple tree. <laughs> and that applies to a pear tree and a cherry tree and a peach tree. Possibly, I didn't try them on the pears, yeah. but uh, I know that if they require the same, which I think they do, yeah. then yes. Okay. Yes, and even, even wild plums had the same exact response. Yeah, I think that's very interesting and it's not the kind of thing you would think about, but it's, I'm sure it's part of the, the deeper training that you provide people, so. Um, for whatever it's worth, I, you know, I was totally <laughs> like five times now <laughs> impressed going to see your operation. Um, all right, we've got about 15 minutes left and eight, nine, <laughs> let me see if I can move through a few of them. Um, have you looked at black soldier fly feed to cut some of your grain costs to recycle some of food waste? No, but we hope somebody in our ecosystem does that. Um, bottom line, I don't want to do that work, um, honestly. But I understand the value. I basically 
you know, listen to one of those innovators at a big forum in San Francisco. And, and I thought, well, that would be an amazing opportunity for, for an entrepreneur to come into one of these ecosystems and set up a black soldier fly operation so that we can do exactly that. Yeah. But the way we see these solutions is not, I am, it's not on a farm level. I don't want to do that on a farm level. When we implement something, it's because it works for the whole, the whole collective. And if something doesn't benefit the collective, uh, then we don't do it. So that's why grain is the same thing. Until we knew that we had enough throughput, we didn't get into that. Now this year, we incorporated a grain elevator because now we can incorporate the farmers too. So same thing with these other options. We want an entrepreneur to emerge. That entrepreneur then goes and figures out how to do this part. And then the ecosystem comes in to ensure that we embrace that entrepreneur and then soldier flies become part of our ecosystem. But that is a decolonized management process right there for you. Well, I mean, I think that the, the, the idea is if there's food waste and it can be used to produce black shoulder fly larvae, that would potentially be a, a, um, a food source for the chickens, which could easily be applied across the ecosystem. Um, oh yeah, no, from, a, from a purely, you know, biological and, you know, purely scientific perspective, I think it's an awesome option. Um, we just need to be able to organize it properly from an entrepreneurial yeah. and management perspective. Cool. All right, uh, Cal asks, how do you operate in the winter? Layers or broilers taking a winter break? With broilers, we take a winter break. Um, with, um, and, and that's why we are setting up a new uh, regional collectives. So we just started the collective out of Omaha and we hope we can find an operating partner down in, in uh, Oklahoma so we can set the Southern collective and that way we can produce uh, uh, broilers year round without ever having to produce in the north because uh, we will have partners everywhere. The egg layers, however, is different. Uh, we, we keep them in the winter so the design of the coops, the processes, everything is, it's almost like, yeah, it is completely different animals different egg layers and broilers. So just to give you an idea, the egg layer has solarium system. The solarium is passive solar. The passive solar allows us, to, we, we focus on heating the ground. As we heat the ground, then we can sprout grains in the winter. We can then sprout grains in artificial settings and then freeze that grain and use that frozen grain as a way to absorb extra nutrition from nutraceuticals like elderberry syrup and, and garlic and onion mixtures with comfrey extracts and all kinds of things like that to germinate them to, to germinate to sprout the grain before we freeze it outside and bring it back into the solariums where then it defrosts and as it defrosts then it rehydrates the whole system of the chicken and those those agronomics and managerial practices allows us to eliminate all of the artificial manipulation of light and everything else and keep the efficiency at about 85% during the winter months and the chickens happy, even though we can't let them out into the open fields. Yeah, I, I hope people understood what you just said. That was, <laughs> it's very impressive. Um, uh, Dara asks again, or she was the one who had talked about the $6 a dozen eggs. She said, the sustainable farmer that delivers charges $6 a dozen for eggs and $15 a pound per kosher chicken. So. That's obviously, <laughs> hopefully they're making good money there. Um, it's a pretty high price. Yeah, yeah, and if they are not, um, they're just giving it away to someone else. That's, that's the way I see it. And I don't think there's necessarily something wrong about it. I mean, if they are paying an immigrant worker a much higher salary because of the fact that they are selling that egg at a much higher price, well, then let's all celebrate that. Um, but if they are wasting it and buying, um, you know, machines and diesel and gasoline and something that extracts the value from that supply chain, well, then let's be let's, let's be a bit smarter about it. The basic point is it doesn't need to be that much, right? There's there's ways of doing it much more economically. But yeah. Oh yeah, direct sales. I mean, we can do well at about three fifty to four dollars a dozen egg. Um, uh, you know, and that's the wholesale value we are charging um, for, actually, for, uh, I, I take that back, the pound of chicken. Um, so, yeah, three times, um, four, 12, yeah, about 15 bucks, 16 bucks per chicken. Yeah. Um, okay. 
Um, Dara asks again, uh, John Kempf mentioned that General Mills is transitioning farmland to sustainable practices. How do you feel about that? Corporations changing. Well, if they are doing that and it is sustainable, let's celebrate that too. Um, corporations have an important role to play in regenerating the planet. Um, but also remember that, like I said before, the most corporations are ran by people who don't give much of a value to feeding us into community well-being and, and health and all of that. Fortunately for us, it's a very small minority. So if General Mills is one that is, doesn't want to belong in that space of exploitation and extraction and destruction of the planet, that's one more on our side of the fence, and that is always good. <laughs> now, whether they're actually doing it or not, that's what we got to verify, which now the trust issue is the, is the real issue here. I think I read something about, an, there was a, was it 15,000 acres or 5,000 acres or something? I'm not sure where it was in um, South Dakota that they had taken over and yeah. I think it was 2 million acres. Whatever, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't, you, you really, I mean, it, yeah, it is laughable because because that ecology doesn't support what they are doing there. So by definition, just growing oats directly, buying them directly from farmers, that has nothing to do with sustainability or resiliency or, or regeneration. That Those are just different management practices that allows a company to claim another space and to you know, build up a little bit more of uh, that karma with consumers so that they can push more products down the line. I mean, that's what I see most of the time, but hey, I don't know the specific story here. Yeah. Somebody can yeah. tell it and say, no, this got integrity, then let's celebrate that. But no integrity, no celebration. Greg says, do you think the healthiest, most nutrient dense foods can slash should also be the least expensive in theory? And to that point, if you're going to be doing monocultures on 5,000 acres, um, you know, only producing one crop functionally increases the, the cost of production of that crop, right? It's only when you've got these multi-factor systems where you're, you know, cycling, cycling energy and pulling a little bit out here that, that the, the, the actual cost of production goes down. Um, yeah, that is, that is correct. That's the circularity of, the, of natural economics. And, and it is extremely efficient at producing value. Uh, value that we can harvest. And so, yes, now the um, the um, uh, nutritional density and the cost and all of that, without any fuss right now, we produce nutrients and we deliver nutrition to consumers at about half the price of a conventional product. Now, here's the qualifier. Dollars per nutrient, you know, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We are not selling pounds of food. We are selling pounds of nutrition. Yeah. And from that perspective, it takes up to seven or eight carrots to deliver the value of one of our carrots. Now, the carrot itself, one of our carrots may be two times more expensive than one of the carrots from the conventional system. But the nutrition in it is about half the cost of the nutrition that, of the, of that you will need to spend in buying enough nutrition because you need about eight of those cheaper carrots to get the same nutrition. So on the nutritional value, we are half as expensive. Yeah, brilliant. Um, Matt asks, um, best guess please, how much energy can be saved when your model of regen farming is compared to an organic system and a conventional system from fork to plate? We really don't know. Uh, we haven't done a, a complete um, footprint, um, foot imprint mostly because the methodology being used actually is, is not compatible with the systems we are deploying. So the tools are not there to actually get a full imprint. Um, I can't tell you that, but what I can tell you is that just um, in general conversations with folks who do this day to day, like uh, David Johnson and, and folks like that, and even you, Dan, what we have figured out is that we are not harvesting more than 40% of the total energy that we are harnessing in that space. And that by definition means we end up, it's, it's like if you earn a dollar and then you only needed to spend 30 to 40 cents to actually live a really comfortable life. And every day you put 70 cents into your next day's pool. That's exactly what we're doing. So I'm happy with that equation. Um, 
I mean, yeah, it will come to the point when we need to figure out the tools that would allow us to completely measure the, all of the verifiers of the system. But the problem is we don't have those tools right now. Uh, I think um, Bio-Nutrient Food Association is working on some of those tools. The instruments of certainly of the, you know, the, the sort of the colonized Western science, you know, framework, but some of those values that you talked about at the beginning are the happiness of the people and the security and, you know, stability of the culture, which, you know, I don't know if they can be monetized or captured in any of those kinds of ways, but yeah, that's a whole different conversation. Um, we've right. got a and that's why I'm saying we don't have the tools yeah. because we, we have never built, um, I mean, the tools we have capture about the same amount of what we use of the of the potential of the landscape. It's about five percent. So the tools have been developed to measure that five percent. But the, what about the other ninety five percent? We don't know how to measure that yet. Now we know it's there because we can feel it, and yeah. it actually shows, and it's real, it's tangible, it's enjoyable, and all of those things. And so, yeah, that's all I need to verify that this is good. The rest of it. Yeah, leave it to the scientists that validated the very system that is wrecking the planet. I don't think they have the moral authority to come and validate the incredible benefits that we are already generating. There's a, yeah, there's various paradigms of engagement. Uh, just in the last couple of minutes, Lenore asked, I'm with you, but given the factors of the way land is owned by a wealthy few, laws perpetuate degeneration and colonization and poverty levels. I would like to see a practical step-by-step -step insurgency process slash blueprint of how to transform this local, global, entrenched economic and political system to a humane, regenerative system. Come to your next presentation, right? Yes, we, we do have not a complete step-by-step -step blueprint, but believe me, we probably have as close as it gets to building a global intellectual insurgency. Yeah. And, to, and it goes right down to the farmer, to the consumer, and the steps we need to take to take back the ownership, control, and governance. That is the secret. And if we can do that, um, here's the thing, it is so doable and it is so easy to do uh, once you are convinced that that's what you want. Once you become an insurgent, then it's easy. The problem is getting people from where they are right now in their position of privilege and comfort and being willing to be uncomfortable for a while and living really in real life so that they can experience the real solutions and then become enchanted with the real solutions to the point that they will never go back that's the transition where we're going to have the most problems. But those folks, like, and I hear this person is probably already on this other side, uh, yeah. there is enough of us right now that a global insurgency now is totally doable within the food and agriculture system. And if we can just network ourselves under the mycelial structures and methodology of the earth itself, we will replicate the most powerful organism on earth, which is the mycelia. And that is our blueprint for the future is the mycelia blueprint replicated in our brain, replicated in the order of the universe, replicated in the way we have built and connected cities and, and centers, now replicating it to take over the food system again. We have done it so many times, we just don't know we've already done it. Yeah, beautiful. Um, okay, a couple last little questions. Uh, Shire um, asks, uh, what are the first three ingredients, ingredients of your non-live chicken feed? Okay, so we have, um, first of all, high protein, um, non-live. I'm guessing she, I'm guessing what's meant is like grains versus sprouts, but I'm not, I'm not actually sure. Right, so uh, let's put it non-ground. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically when you grind grain, you are killing it. Yeah. So you have deprived it from its ability to live. And now it becomes mass, biomass. And so literally there is no ability for that organism anymore to, to interact because it's dead. So um, what we do is in the non-ground up dead is where we, we focus on high protein, low fiber uh, forages. And so within that the king of all of them is comfrey. 26% protein, only about 10 to 11% fiber and succulent, which means the chickens can roam forever because they don't have to go back for water more than like, you know, maybe five, 25% of the time than they, if they were eating dry grain, for example. One, two, 
um, we look for weeds uh, that are got the same characteristics. So mallow, for example, lamb quarters, purslin, all of those are actually succulent, but also high in protein, low in fiber. We avoid grasses altogether unless it's just sprouted. So we bring grass seeds in the form of wheat, barley, oats, and then we sprout them and we have the chickens roaming in there within the first two to three, up to four days after the, the, the grain sprouts, but we don't want it to grow because the second that, that grain starts to grow a stem, it completely flips the equation and it goes high in fiber, low in protein. And at that point, it robs the chicken of its nutritional needs. Instead, it will, it will, it will, it will, it will, it works the opposite. And when um, you say it takes sprout, energy away, right? when you say sprout, what you do is you take the whole grains, you broadcast them out in the paddock, you cover them with a little bit of hay, and then if it's dry out, you water them. So you're not sprouting them in trays inside and bringing them out to the, to the chickens. You're just broadcasting them out into the paddock is what I experienced, right? It's a whole different way of doing things. Oh yeah, yeah. And part of the part of the reason we can do this at a scale is one, because you can just put these grain mixes right into your tractor spreader and take 600 pounds and just spread them down the alleys. Uh, one, two, it spreads them horizontally, which means it goes under the trees, as you can see in the in the picture. Now, three, the 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 um, the, the um, cover crops in the ground, the shade from the trees. And the amount of organic matter in that soil means a high level of uh, humidity in that soil, even during droughts. There is a lot of humidity that condenses there. That means easy way to sprout. And if you're smart before you get those units established, you can put an irrigation system, which is what I'm doing now in the new farms, not for the purpose of extracting water out of a system. You could take rainwater, put it into a big pool, and then pump it. And you only have to do a little tiny bit of that because you already have an environment that will preserve and conserve the water anyway. And bam, you got a massive sprouting system. And I know, I, I'll just tell you this confidently to all of you. Uh, two, two years ago, we raised a flock of broilers and we were able to remove the ground up feed, 100% of it for four weeks. And they still matured just five days delayed than the rest of the chickens that were on that regular diet. So I'm telling you that the, 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 the level of innovation and the ability of us to compete collectively, if we can do this at a scale, is so massive. Uh, it's, it's a real, a real hack of a system. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, that's a, a, probably a good way to end. We're, we're over time, but are there any final insights or comments you'd like to share with us before we say thank you to everyone? Well, it looks like Greg is fired up and wants to do the whole thing. Um, uh, so yeah, give him my email. I don't know if I have access to his. It looks like you gave him, you gave him your website so he can find you, but yeah. Okay, but I'm gonna give you my email directly, Greg. Okay, well, thank you, Reggie. I, I really appreciate you having gone through now three sessions with us and looking forward to the, to the, uh, the, the, the climax <laughs> <laughs> presentation next time. People think this has been good. Wait till wait till he actually lets it all hang out. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Feed the chickens, free the people. All Goodbye. right. Great, thank you all.